nexus of conspiracy theory and the paranormal meet. And now, we join the show already in progress with your hosts, Adam and Seraphiel. Welcome back to Conspiracy Normal, guys. Adam and this guy in the house. In the house. So, guys, um, we have Marie D. Jones on the line, and we were just talking about it, and she couldn't believe that it's been almost four, well, it's been over four years, actually, (laughs) since I had you on back to talk, and I realized that was about the Mind Wars book that we had you on to talk about. Wow. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> that was I, I remember that episode because that was the first episode that we did when we were this is you probably won't remember but when we did this with we did it when we had Rob as our old, as the producer and um, that was the first one we ever oh, did yeah, it we ever did it at his okay. house okay and there's a yeah. funny story about that episode because um, in the like at, we had our old co-host Luke at the time and Luke he liked to sleep a lot during the show that was like his like conspiracy normal was his nappy time and rob had this little like it was a, it was a catalog a little music instrument catalog and luke was looking through it right and luke, rob was still kind of getting like the stuff set up and trying to figure stuff out and in, inside the studio because it's the first time we'd done it over there and he had like the what is it the limiter i think like way up to the way up or way down and you could hear Luke like roaming through the pages, and it's like, yeah, oh, <laughs> the entire time that we're talking to you, you just hear this clink, clink, clink. I don't remember that, but that's funny. you probably yeah, that's, you probably couldn't hear it. it. Stop. <laughs> you you probably could not hear it. But uh, I got I got so much so much slack from that from people. It just, it was like, it was, oh my god! Or flack actually is the right word. But it was uh, yeah, that was our <laughs> that was our first show and, uh, over there, and you got but to you, know uh, what? That you got happens. to be a part of you it. Know, you get out the kinks and you learn. And <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody actually yeah. emailed me about it. Like, this is episode one hundred. This is episode like ninety something. Like, don't you guys know what you're doing <laughs> by now? <laughs> you know, you just have to pretend you don't know what it is anymore. Oh my, what is that? There Dude, was we're the only ones here. What is that? It's an EVP. <laughs> There was one episode where Rob had the door, he had the windows open, right? And we had the guest talking, and you could hear the crickets outside. <laughs> and it was, like, oh, really well, loud. Kind of gives it a little atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> so this person's talking, and all you hear is... <laughs> the entire time. You know what? I've been on shows where the host dogs start barking at the storm. Uh-huh. Cause, or because the, the doorbell rings, or... You know, they don't tell you the mic is hot, and then, you know, you're, you're like, God damn it, it's whatever. Right, right. <laughs> Excuse my French. Uh, that happened to me, actually. I think the first, the, one of the times I was on Coast to Coast, they had to tell me, um, you know, be careful what you say when during commercial breaks, because your mic is hot. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm yelling at my dog, get down, get down, get away from me. Yeah, yeah, so, what happens? I think it makes it more interesting, though. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that would make it a lot more interesting. <laughs> so it keeps it real. It's not all perfect and polished. Yeah, that's that's one way to put it, I suppose. Um, yeah, of course. So you've got a book out. Okay, I do have books out. <laughs> several of them, and we're going to talk about some of the subjects tonight. But the one, I guess, is the, I think it's the latest one now: Celebrity Ghosts and Notorious Haunting. It is, although um, just on November 1st, 11, 11, the Time Crop Phenomenon, it's actually a re-release. It's a revised edition. So I don't know if that counts as a new book or not, but I kind of count it. So those those are both out now. Celebrity Ghost is the, the most recent, though. 
Okay. That's yeah, that's not a, a revised edition. Eleven, eleven. That's like a new like edition that's come out. So it's celebrity yeah, ghosts yeah, we'll and, and notorious hauntings. Edition with some updated material, which is really cool because of all the books that I have written with Larry Flaxman, Eleven Eleven was our biggest best selling book. And people just love it and they still love it. And so it was kind of kind of cool that, you know, the publisher um, the books got sold to a new bigger publisher and they said, Hey, why don't we revise and update this? Put on a really cool new cover, which I, I love the cover that they came up with. Oh, so okay. I, you know, I'm hoping they'll do that with a couple of my other books, like Science. I would really, really love to revise and update that book, but we'll see. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this one, you're talking about Celebrity Ghost. Well, this is more kind of like an encyclopedia type of book. It is. I mean, really, that's what it is. <clears throat> I was, you know, asked to compile as many um, celebrity ghost sightings as celebrities who have seen ghosts and just notorious hauntings, meaning, you know, hauntings that are memorable or um, recognizable, even if it's just to a certain location or region. And I avoided haunted houses because there's just way too many of those. Yeah. So it's pretty much everything but haunted houses. But just as much as I could cram in, and honestly, I could probably have done another two volumes and still had stories left over. Now, of course, that the book is out, people are emailing me and messaging me all the time. Oh, you should have included that. And they'll tell me these amazing stories. It's like, ah, darn it. You know, hang on to that just in case I get to do a volume two, which is kind of weird. I guess it shows you just how haunted this country is. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot there, and there's a <laughs> lot of stories in this book and, and outside of this book. You think you'll do another volume? I could if it sells really well. I There's no reason why not because... You know, when it comes to the celebrity ghosts, that that's a little harder to find. Um, but although although even with that, I had people telling me, oh, you know, I know this story of Elvis, and that's not something that I had included because I hadn't heard it. So they're probably, like, if I had the time to really put the call out, um, I probably could get a, a lot more celebrity site, ghost sightings, too. But definitely the locations, I really, because I included so many different categories, I had to like, oh, geez, narrow it down to like the top 10 or 20 and leave out some really good ones just simply because I didn't have the page count for them, not because they weren't, you know, good stories. And then again, when you talk to people and you find out locally, there are stories that they have in their own hometown that, you know, maybe I didn't, wasn't aware of, and especially urban legends. If you don't ask people, then some of the really great stories just kind of slip through. And the ones that you hear in Morocco, like there's a lot of locations in here that everybody's heard of. And I really didn't want to focus a lot of energy on those because you could turn on the TV and all these different ghost hunting shows you're going to see people going to the same locations over and over. But I felt like, you know, I had an obligation to at least give them a little bit of mention. But yeah, it's just been amazing. I would say every day I get at least one or two messages on Facebook or something with, oh, I have to tell you about what happened at this hotel in my city. And it's like, ah, darn it. I wish I would have known that before. Yeah. But those are things you can't possibly know unless you get something out there first. Yeah, you're getting that firsthand like <laughs> knowledge from from different people about what's in their yeah, city yeah. or what's in their state or their town or just whatever. Um, these yeah. different these these different things. Um, has any what any of that like kind of like um, been really stood stood out to you? Any stuff that's like that you're info information that you're getting now that's kind of st- stood out to you? Yeah, you know it's weird that every little town has at least one creepy urban legend. And I, I include those, <laughs> even though they're not 
necessarily like a ghost or, or apparition, that type of a haunting. But they still fall under that kind of paranormal umbrella. And a lot of times they do involve a ghost, you know, the hitchhiker that people see on the side of the road. That is actually an urban legend in dozens of towns yeah. all across the country. And it's like almost archetypal. So is the lady in white. Yeah. I mean, we have one here where I live that I actually went to look for. Those are really cool because people are seeing some kind of ghostly apparition. But there's also a really creepy urban legend story that goes with it. And as with any legend, there's a grain of truth. There's a, a person who actually existed um, or there's a, an event or a situation that actually really occurred. But over time, you know, got embellished and it turned into this spooky urban legend. But if you go back and research it, you'll see, oh my gosh, that really happened. Maybe not in the way it's being told today. But, you know, there really was a lady in white. And there really are a lot of um, people that get hit on the side of the road while they're hitchhiking. I mean, there's no reason why there wouldn't be a lot of ghosts of, of hitchhikers. So, yeah, that was really interesting to me. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, the, the famous one of the hitchhikers yeah. that comes to mind for me, of course, is, you know, that's Resurrection Mary. That's the one that stands out. But I've I've also heard people that will say, you know, the, on some deserted highway somewhere in the middle of the night, pick somebody up and then they get out of the car and then they wonder where they were. You know, I've, I've heard those type of stories, too. So those are those are very, very common. And yeah, and it is kind of weird because it makes you wonder, wait a minute, you know, <clears throat> why are these so common? It, does it have something to do with with us, <laughs> with, you know, some weird uh, manifestation that we hear about an urban legend in one city and then we sort of start seeing it and perceiving it in, in our own hometown, almost like we expect to see it? Why are there so many roaming, crying ladies in white? Whether yeah. it's in a church graveyard or the side of a freeway, or a lot of times they're by rivers and creeks and water sources. Well, you know, what are they, is this something symbolic? It's, it's just, it's creepy. <laughs> When you talk about but the... yeah, we have a lady right here that I actually went to look for, and I didn't find her, but I had some really crazy stuff happen to me, and it was really scary. And but but there are people that to this day insist that they see this sort of spectral you know entity out in the woods. So are they lying? You know, are they making it up, or is there something that just sort of appears every now and then to people that keeps perpetuating the urban legend? I think that's entirely possible. I mean, I, you know, that's the you go back to like I'm, I'm, I don't guess you're familiar. You're probably familiar with Greg Bishop and like the co-creation theory. And this a lot of this has to do with like ufology and, um, and you know, lack of a better term, aliens or whatever. But you know, I think it works for ghosts too. That you know, you've got these archetypes and that these things will appear to us the way that they think that we need to, we should be able to see them. I think that's part of it. And that will kind of understand. Like, I bet yeah. you have. Do you have an urban legend in your in your town? Do you guys have? Each of you have one. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned the lady in white. I don't know about Nashville, but I know that Chattanooga has it, where I'm originally from. Um, there is a lady. There is a lady in white there. That I just that, that I've heard about, and it's associated with uh, the Chickamauga battlefield. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. which is also yeah, you know the whole book. the whole green eyes story too. But uh, and I think I think here in Nashville, so, I think um, what is it, Adelicia Acklin? That's it. Yeah, that's she's it. in white, right? right, and so right. She's an old uh, mm -hmm. Southern oh, Belle. See, isn't that weird? <laughs> yeah, it's this common thing. Do they have stories behind them that anybody's ever like traced back to? You know, somebody who who actually existed or, or died tragically or lost the yeah. left one tragically. Yeah. That one that Sir Field just mentioned, yeah, Adelicia. Now, I don't I don't I'm not too familiar with the story or I may have forgotten about what the, the exact story is. She but. was she was widowed, I guess. Um she was the wealthiest woman in Tennessee and a plantation owner after her husband, uh, Isaac Franklin died. Yeah. 
So uh-huh. you've got that kind of like tragic, you know, the tragic figure of the bride that loses the husband or whatever, you know, or the, just the young right. girl. Or sometimes a child. And yeah, I think me and Adam, me and Adam saw her uh, little little tomb, I think, over at uh, Mount Olivet Cemetery. Did we? Yeah. Okay, so she's buried there but too. I think she roams, she roams Belmont though, I think. That's it. Yeah, Belmont University here in Nashville. There's the lady, the Adelicia is the lady in white. There's actually an apartment. One of the newer apartment buildings here in Nashville is named that, the Adelicia. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah that's a trip. But th- here's yeah. some interesting twists on the lady in white stuff. Now, you know, anybody that listens to this show, they know this, that, you know, it's, uh, our friends, our friends, um, Timothy Renner and Joshua Cutchin are working on a book right now. It's actually going to be two books. And they're working on a book about like kind of like supernatural Bigfoot. And they found out that there is a that there's this lady in white motif. La- a lady in white will show up right before a Bigfoot sighting. Oh, that's kind of bizarre. Seriously, <laughs> yeah. it work, like everywhere or just in one location? Or? It's it, they've got several of these stories collected. That they've talked about. Okay, they so actually what does that re- mean? <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I know. But I think it's a... They look at it as kind of like, you know, this like folklore. Um, There's almost like a Beauty and the Beast kind of thing. And then there's also some things yeah, about fairy that's, lore, that's about uh, how fairies... Uh, you will have like the, the, the really beautiful looking fairies and then you will have the ones that are more ugly in fairy lore yeah and so that troll, that's, troll-like kind of right and you've also got <laughs> yeah. these big hairy beasts that, that are that are a big part of folklore so this is again just another modern day iteration of that where people are seeing the woman in white and then all of a sudden bigfoot shows up well it's, yeah it's almost like having her show up first you, you don't you're not as afraid you know, this woman, she's wearing white, usually mourning or grieving. Yeah. So you kind of feel some empathy, compassion, and then boom, you know, <laughs> there's Bigfoot. There's Bigfoot. So you know what it sounds like? I don't know if you guys, have you, <laughs> it's like, hey, she's like the, uh, you know, what do you call it, the MC that introduces Bigfoot. Um, in ufology, like a lot of abductees in the past, I don't know about now so much, I've been out of it for a while, but they used to often report seeing an owl right. outside their window on a tree branch or on the windowsill yeah. right before an abduction experience. And, and it's almost as if, and sometimes the owl would sort of morph into the, the typical gray with the big eyes. And yeah. It's almost as if our brain can't handle the actual reality. So either it's our brain perceiving the you know gray as something that we understand or it's them doing that on purpose so that here we're showing you something normal and that's the last thing you see before boom you know the abduction occurs so yeah it sounds like the same almost like a screening kind of thing another thing in ufology is driving down the street and you see a huge accident off to the side of the road but everything looks really weird and and bizarre it just doesn't feel right and then boom you experience an abduction so that's what i haven't heard in a while (laughs) you know what yeah i haven't heard that one in a while either i know in like the 80s and 90s that was a big thing that people would report seeing an accident and they would pull over and then you know next thing you know they're they've lost two three hours and lord knows what happened to them but it is I guess it's a lot like, you know, if something traumatic happens, the well, way that we we screen it out with false memories or, you know, we make up a new story to describe it to ourselves so we don't freak ourselves out. Well, deer are another one that uh, people say that they see, and that's part of the, the, the alien abduction screen memories. People will see deer as well. Uh you know, of course, Mike Cleland, yeah. if you're familiar with him, you know, he's the owl guy. Oh, he's the owl? Yeah, I read his owl book. I think that's so cool. Yeah. 
so of course, cool. what a lot of what Mike talks about <laughs> is experiences people are having and weird synchronicities people are having with with real owls, not just like in the whole alien abduction phenomenon, but like actual flesh and blood owls and like these weird things yeah. like that happen regarding them. And then you've got this whole thing about owls and being, you know, the symbol of death. Um, there's, you know, several goddesses in mythology that they're associated with as well so yeah, it's, it's like yeah, all this stuff really just kind of ties in together well it reminds me of like all the mothman um the, the with the mothman sightings there was always other stuff going on at the same time ufo yep. sightings um cryptids people having psychic experiences getting weird phone calls or seeing, you know, having weird visions, what have you. So it's almost like one of them triggers a a different type of experience or one of them is like the gateway, like a gateway drug, right, to the the bigger stuff. Um, But that's what it sounds like with this lady in white thing because really, why else would that happen with a Bigfoot sighting? What possibly... How possibly could the two be connected? Otherwise, that I've never heard of that. That is really weird. Yeah, it is really weird. So, if it only happened once, I would think, yo, okay. Yeah. But if these guys are finding uh, several of these, then there's definitely something going on. Yeah, I, I know Josh and Tim have got several that they've collected, and uh, really, the, their book that's coming out, or it's actually two volumes, called "Where the Footprints End." Um, I think it's going to be really, a really, really good book because they're going to, uh, they're really going to challenge that whole cryptozoological aspect that it's just like an ape in the woods and it doesn't, it's nothing more than that because they're bringing in a lot they, of more They weird believe stuff. that or they're challenging that? They're challenging that viewpoint, yeah. I totally agree with them. I think it's interdimensional. Yeah. I think there's a lot I more think, going on. And I always felt it just acted like something interdimensional. The fact that we could never find one. I mean, come on. We yeah. could find things if we really want to. What's going on here? Yeah, no doubt. And that it's just, yeah, one of many different cryptids that have always sort of fallen into that weird rabbit hole of not really being quite physical, but not being, you know, just apparition. Well, they're, they're that weird in between. The title of the book is called "Where the Footprints End" because that's in reference to people that will be tracking Bigfoot or whatever, and then all of a sudden the footprints just stop. Yeah. So what? So what happened there? Where did it go? Yeah. yeah. Did it teleport? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's not funny. It could be true. <laughs> well. I got picked up by the, the mothership or whatever, but yeah, it's really, I don't know, it makes more sense. If you look at those, like the Stan Gordon material from like uh, Pennsylvania, the, <laughs> the like Chestnut Ridge area oh, that yeah. he talks about and all those sightings, I mean, that's when it gets really, really weird. I, uh, do you guys watch the, um, what are the videos? Oh gosh, I just drew a blank. Small, t- is it small yeah. town monsters. Seth Green love stuff. Oh, yeah. those are those are really really cool. They're really fun to watch. They're well researched, but they're also done in a way. Like a lot of documentaries I watch, and I'm asleep halfway through. <laughs> so there's that one I remember because of the weird shape of those creatures. It was like mechanical, weird looking, not the usual shape of any other alien that's ever been reported. It's like, what is up with that? There's been quite a few of those. Yeah. I, it's, it's, but that's another case, too. It's like Skinwalker Ranch. And, and it's another case of where you're not just talking about one thing. Yeah, which you, you know, write about in the book. The, the Skinwalker UFO, Ranch. Cryptid, you name it. You get into stuff like too. Um, I know in, in Seth's movies, there's also the uh, the Flatwoods monster, which is just really um, weird. I, I think I might have touched on it, but see, here's where the idea of doing a second and third book would come in, because I 
I I wanted to put UFO sightings in. Well, there was no room. I wanted to put more cryptid stuff in, and I might actually suggest that to the publisher, you know, volume two and volume three. So I was trying to stick really hard to other than the urban legend stuff, because to me that kind of falls closely into the hauntings and the ghosts and all that stuff. But I had to really stick closely to ghosts and apparitions and those, yeah. that kind of haunting. But I would love to have included, I think had I done that, this book would have been five times this big. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say it's already pretty extensive. So much of it. Well, you know, and again, like with the urban legends, I will bet you that every region in the country, maybe even going smaller than just looking at like regions, has a, a cryptid that is reported there all the time. Or definitely, I mean, UFOs, that's a whole different thing. They're obviously all over the place. But, you know, you've got the Jersey Devil, you've got the Thunderbirds, you've got like different parts of the country have their sort of pet cryptid and but we usually only hear about the ones that get more press you know they get more media and i would be real curious to know does every town or every you know county or whatever have have one of their own or have one that's really prominent there there's a map out there in the united states that shows the the most like biggest cryptid in each state that's pretty cool if you ever get a chance okay, to look at that. Okay, what's California, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, probably Bigfoot. Like, probably know. Patty, because I think yeah, that was I California. Think, I think, yeah, it, I think so. Because we do actually have a lot of um, forest areas, you know, in the north. I'm in the south where it's a desert and beach, but yeah, yeah, I would think definitely in the northern, central and northern parts where there's a lot of forest. Right, I think Bigfoot. I think Bigfoot is. I've never heard of any cryptid in this area. I'd have to think about what uh, what Tennessee what what Tennessee's is. I can't I can't think of it. It's called the United United Monsters of America, something like that. Oh, that's cool. I gotta look for that. Oh, I bet you you're in the Tennessee area because there's so much greenery and forests and places for them to hide. There's probably all kinds of crazy. Where was the Beast of Bray Road? Where was that one? That was in Ohio or somewhere? Wisconsin. I, uh, I bet you there's one in every state. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I have to look at that. Florida's probably got a million of them. So Tennessee is... Florida is so weird. Tennessee's is <laughs> the Wampus Cat. <laughs> oh, <laughs> cool. cat. So like a giant cat? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We That's think we've got wild. one that hangs out here but it's outside the studio. So I think that's a Wampus cat. I'm gonna call him Do Wampus. you know anybody who has ever seen a Wampus cat? I don't know anyone that's seen a Wampus cat. Can't say that I do. No. <coughs> I wonder where they, those things... California, according to this <laughs> map. Like Native American legend. Yeah, I think so, probably. Probably East Tennessee, I think, is where it hangs out. That's what it says. But according to this map, Bigfoot is the is is California's. Okay, but I would think also like Oregon and Washington. Oh yeah, for right. sure. All up the Pacific Northwest is like Bigfoot country. There's a lot of lake monsters on this map. Yeah, that's true. That too, I could see. Great Lakes area probably has a few. In fact, I know they have one. I'm not sure which of the five lakes, but it's like a little nasty kind of monster. And of course, you got um, you got the puckwudgies in Massachusetts. Huh. <laughs> you were, I think you're right about the wampus cat. Uh, it says uh, folklorist Vance Randolph described the wampus cat as a kind of amphibious panther which leaps into the water and swims like a colossal mink. So, and it has huh. some relation to Cherokee mythology, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's one we don't hear about hear about too much. But apparently, in our state, that's the number one cryptid. Kansas apparently doesn't get a cryptid according to this map. I don't know why, but so oh, can't, can't, it's all flat. Maybe they're too visible. Kansas has to step up its game. Thunderbirds. <laughs> <laughs> I figured Chupacabra's probably moving up there by now. Yeah. So let's yeah. talk. Let's talk a little bit about some celebrity ghosts. So I I think that uh, 
First of all, what's the what's the difference between you know usual ghosts and, and a celebrity, celebrity ghost? <laughs> Good question. Because <laughs> but there are differences. I've heard. Well, heard you, you know, <laughs> really not much. I mean, a ghost is a ghost, but hey, it's just a, a more recognizable ghost. You know, one that people can identify. They because celebrities obviously millions of people know who they are, and we we sort of feel like we know these people personally. And especially the bigger legends and icons like, you know, John Lennon and, and Elvis and Marilyn Monroe and even the historical ghosts like Abraham Lincoln. We feel like we know them just by the very nature of the fact that they're famous. <laughs> but in terms of appearance, nothing, nothing at all is different. And the celebrities kind of occupy the space that the like ancient heroes and mythology used to have for us now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately, I think in a lot of cases. Right. <laughs> um, because, you know, they're usually deeply flawed people. And a lot of the reason why we see so many celebrity ghosts is because they, a lot of them die under very tragic circumstances, whether drug overdoses or suicide or murder, you know, so... We seem to associate trauma and, and emotional trauma and tragedy with more ghostly activity. So, like, with someone like Elvis, I mean, he's seen all over the place. He's seen at his, the home he used to have here in Southern California. His ghost is, is seen at the Las Vegas Hilton Hotel that he performed at. Um, outside of Graceland, in the old RCA studio he used to record in. I mean, he gets he gets around. And that actually is, to me, kind of interesting because are these, like, on the other side, on the other side of reality, whatever death is, can ghosts travel? They obviously must be able to get from point A to point B. If we're having people you know, seeing them in different locations, not always in the same place. Like in a graveyard where you typically hear about some, a ghost hanging out. So that's kind of unusual. Um, you know, John Lennon, he's been seen outside of the hotel that he was, the Dakota Apartments, mm -hmm. where he was assassinated. He's been seen inside by Yoko Ono. He's been seen in different recording studios that he worked at. He's been seen, you know, there were a lot of stories that I found out later, like he'd been seen in an art gallery in New York City that he used to visit. So are they like wandering around after they're dead too, just going to all these different places that they loved and enjoy in life? Um, which is in stark contrast to the ghosts that you hear about that only hang out at like a, a cemetery or a graveyard and, the, and they look miserable and unhappy. Um, you know, the ghosts are like, no, 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 her ghost is at her favorite hotel. And it, nobody has ever said, oh, she, she looks, her ghost looks sad or depressed like the lady in white. So I, you know, to me, it's, it, I have to wonder if it's us seeing different Elvises <laughs> in different locations because we expect to. Whereas maybe his real ghost only hangs out in one. You know, could it be could it be us that are kind of creating some of these sightings mentally? I don't know. But it's just strange that some ghosts stayed in one they stayed in one location and others are all over the place. They go on tour. So we expect to see someone in a particular area and then we actually see them? It could be, you know, somebody jokingly said, well, you know, there are a lot of Elvis impersonators who really worshipped and adored him. So when they died, maybe you're seeing that. Well, I don't know about that. It could be true. But when we go to say we go to visit Graceland, I've never been there. <clears throat> but if we expect, oh, you know, I've heard people have seen Elvis's ghost here. Ooh, does that kind of set us up maybe to be a part of whatever that progression of events has to occur in order for us to observe a ghost or perceive one. Because a lot of people go to Graceland and see his ghost, and a lot of people go to Graceland and don't. Yeah. You know? So what's up with that? Is he off visiting 
the uh, RCA recording studio. It's a time when some people go to grave studies just in doses and home. Um, it just kind of opens up a whole lot of different questions. That was probably one of the biggest things writing this book, other than, you know, good Lord, it's <laughs> haunted bridges and tunnels and highways and byways and locations out there. Um, it was just the fact that we've always kind of associated a ghost with a particular location. And when you start looking at them being five, six places at once, it, you know, you start to wonder what's going on. And, uh, and who's to say that on the other side, after you die, you're not still able to, in some way, you know, move around. Um, I like to think, I like to think of the more scientific things like parallel universes, right? And so we're told by quantum physicists, well, if they exist, and they're pretty sure they do, we could be alive in a million different parallel universes all at once. And so maybe we're seeing the people that we see and we say it's a ghost because they're dead here. Mm-hmm. Well, they're alive in one of these other universes. So we're seeing them interacting and doing everything as if they're here, but they're really in another parallel universe. Very similar to this one. Maybe the timeline's tweaked a little which would explain the same historical ghost. So I, I, I don't know. It just opens a big can of worms. And that possibility that that parallel universe could also be the past. I know that there's... Um, Absolutely. Paul Eno yeah. is out there. and I mean, I, he talks about this. I never, I've never had him on the show. Really should get him on. But he talks about this whole concept of just like, you know, what what he believes people are seeing when they see ghosts is this like time is overlapping. So everything is actually happening all at once, but we perceive it literally. But at a certain point, there's like a break in that. Yeah. Yeah. And we see that. So, so we're able to, sometimes we're able to see that bleed over. And I find that to be like an interesting concept or like there's something going on. There could be something going on with time as well. Um, well, uh, yeah, time is, time does not exist in a linear fashion outside of the construct of the human brain. True. Our brains are the only thing that puts time in a past, present, future linear structure. In the quantum field, Time exists all at once, past, present, and the future. It's like a field of information. You can walk through a field like a field of daisies or grass or whatever, and past, present, and future is all there. So are you, at, you know, now and then you somehow are getting a glimpse into universe D at this time frame in the past and maybe universe J a little bit in the future, and also sometimes probably getting glimpses of other universes at the same time, which I believe is deja vu. Mm-hmm. Getting a glimpse of yourself in a mirror universe, because come on, if there's an infinite number of them, chances are pretty good there's quite a few of that where the timelines sync up to the one that we're in. And, you know, just very briefly, which is why experiences like deja vu are so brief. Are you experiencing something in a timeline that is almost like similar to her own? Because if you think about like the whole idea of parallel universes, you know, every time we make, we turn right instead of left, we create another universe. I mean, that's the whole idea. Yeah. So the, the number could be just infinite. Yeah, and it is to say that those moments where I think, oh my God, I, I had this conversation before, and you have a sense of precognition, even though it's very, 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 very quick. I mean, right. you know, it's like you're able to predict what the person's going to say, you know, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second before they say it, but that's still precognition. And it could be that just for that 10 seconds or 15 seconds, you're synced up to alternate you in alternate universe, you know, that's, that's literally operating on an almost exact timeline to this one. Right. 
And again, in that universe, you're, you're having lunch with the same person. You're dressed the same way. And people will say, oh, it's just glitches of the brain. But you have such an all-purpose excuse for not thinking about what these things actually are. It's BS. You know, deja vu is one of the most researched experiences that there is because it's a side effect of a lot of other things that have accidentally allowed it to be researched in a clinical setting, like epilepsy and grand mal seizures and a deep brain massage and, you know, to, to cure deep brain traumas and people would experience deja vu and so they would be able to look at parts of the brain that were firing um, you know, exactly what was going on at the time. So we know that there's something going on. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a glitch of memory because when it happens in an organic, natural setting, you know, you're not you're not in a lab where somebody's going to stimulate your brain and make you have deja vu. So I, I feel like there is a scientific explanation for everything that we are talking about but we just don't quite know what they are. We have ideas, but no, you know, no solid proof of evidence yet. Is there any particular one of these like ghosts that um, I've got some listed here? These celebrity ghosts, but they like the particular ones that like stand out to you? Not particularly because they're all very similar in that they tend to all again haunt. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry for coughing. Um, their favorite locations, they seem to they seem to haunt locations that were more positive. And, I mean, you know, like with the exception of maybe like something like Buddy Holly, we died in a plane crash and his ghost is seen, even though it's seen in other places that are more positive, it's also seen at the site where the plane crash took place. So you do see a lot of that. Um it's like one story that was actually a, someone, I had never heard of this, and somebody told me I had to include it. And I didn't even know who the person was. And it's the story of Johnny Horton. And this is a country music legend. I mean, I'm not big on country music, but apparently he's written some huge classics. And he was somebody who was very spiritual, his interest in the paranormal. He would meet with a medium all the time. Who was that? And um, Johnny Horton. Johnny Horton. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He was. He, he wrote the Battle of New Orleans. You know that oh. kind of stuff. Yeah. So anyway, he was really good friends with another singer songwriter named Earl Kilgore. This was kind of kind of an interesting thing that happened. And Johnny had a feeling he was going to die, and he wanted a way to communicate with his buddy Earl in the afterlife. So literally one week later, he was killed by a drunk driver. Years later, Merle Kilgore, the friend, was on a radio show with a friend of his radio announcer, Bob Lockwood. Bob introduced Merle Kilgore on the air. They played The Ring of Fire, which um, Kilgore had written for Johnny Cash, famous song. And during the time they were playing it, a woman called into the show. This is just totally out of the blue. And she said she was part of a group of psychics that the night before had done a Ouija board session. And the name Merle Kilgore had come up on the Ouija board. And that a message had come through with it saying, the drummer is a rubber and he can't hold the beat. So Merle Kilgore, who's in the radio uh, announcement, booth at the time, hears this and freaks out because that was the exact message that Johnny Horton told him that he would leave, you know, leave for him somehow after his death. So those kinds of things are kind of cool. Cool. Do you got any more um, uh, any more country music ones? We're in Nashville, you know. I know you are. Well, you know, I mean, Elvis, come on. Well, Hank Williams, apparently. Yeah, so country music I think the RCA, <laughs> I think the RCA studios you're referring to is here. Yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah. Studio yeah, B. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, Hank Williams, let's see, he haunts, haunts 
or yeah, he's still haunts. The um, Ryman Auditorium, right. which is the former home of the Grand Old Opry, uh-huh. where he performed often. Um, I'm trying to see other country <laughs> music. Like, you've got a lot of people like Jimi Hendrix, you know, Jim Morrison. Uh, Little Ratch is not country. Then, was, the, <laughs> <laughs> was the Burger King that Elvis frequented, was that in Memphis or here? He was That's working there. That was after he died. Eat. Okay. Well, supposedly he liked to go there to eat. From let's see, Burger King, Burger King, Memphis. He was even reported seen in the local Memphis Burger King. Did he work there? I didn't know that. <laughs> no, that's the that's the old joke from when the whole Elvis is alive oh, stuff. Okay, okay. What, okay. Was that oh. like <laughs> the whole the whole Elvis is alive like uh, conspiracy and like you'd, you'd see that stuff in like the Weekly World News back in the day oh, where they'd say like Elvis sided working at Burger King and. <laughs> That kind of stuff. See, what I've heard, like this one, the only thing that I have is an association with a lot of people said that he liked to eat there all the time because he loved junk food. Uh-huh. But, you know, I I don't have any, like, personal accounts of that. That was just something uh, um, that I, I saw a few times, like, oh, brother. Maybe because, you know, like Orson Welles, he, his ghost has been seen and smelled because he liked to smoke cigars mm. at um, one of the restaurants that he loved. And that, you hear about that a lot. You hear about people hanging out at like cafes and restaurants and hotels that they stayed at a lot when they were you know, in the industry of working. Um, because those are like positive places. That brings up another thing that really bugs me is why any ghost would ever choose to haunt a cemetery, an asylum, a prison. Yeah. I mean, yes, I know the time yeah. when maybe they could die there. But I feel like if I were able to get around, I would want to go to more positive places. Like, but, but I don't know. They could be trapped in printed energy there. It could be that kind of a sighting. That's what I yeah. That's what I think. When you've got these places like Waverly Hills, which are just like incredibly haunted up in Louisville, um, any of this like asylums or whatever, yeah, these old the hospitals. Yeah. yeah, it almost seems like those people are just trapped there. I mean, that's that's like hellacious. You know, that's like that's like a form yeah. of your own personal kind of form of hell. I mean, you would almost want to think of like somebody it. that that lives through that kind of mental illness or has been you know mistreated like that that they die and that's like a relief. But then it seems like they're stuck there. But again, it could be. And there's the whole residual haunting theory of that. that right. It's just an exactly. it's just an imprint on the environment. Right, and the ghost isn't sentient. It's not aware. It's it's just sort of like a a loop of, of yeah, almost like a movie loop of a scene yeah. that repeats over and over again. And that would make more sense. You know, I've also thought about. I've heard people say, well, it could be that they're trying to resolve the traumatic way that they lived and then died. That there's this weird, you know, feeling of. If, if I stay here, I can maybe change something or I can resolve. I can't move on until I sort of settle something emotionally. So, but I just feel like I would be, I'd be at the beach, you know, or I'd be walking <laughs> my kid. Right, right, <laughs> right. Or, or coming back to check on your loved ones or just like you would think that, you know, that's, that's where you would be. But it could be just in the fact that they're always stuck in that loop and then they die. Maybe they don't know and then they're stuck there. But I think there could be yeah, another. Th- too. I think there could be another theory about some of this. And especially as the ghost hunting stuff has gotten more and more popular. And I mean, it's still around. It hasn't really left. It's lost its popularity. People still really enjoy doing it. Um, and people, yeah. people, a lot of people go to a place like Waverly Hills and they're always looking for ghosts and they're always putting, they're always putting their energy into looking for things. And it, it's possible that you could have like, you know, like the, the, the Philip experiment type of effect where essentially. That's a big one for me. I totally agree that that has to be looked into more like the Tulpa 
right creating creating and manifesting like especially if you have a big group you know you've got all that in that sort of intended energy to manifest something that desire that oh we're all going to see this you know how powerful our thoughts and Mm -hmm. are we sort of collectively out of our expectations creating something that isn't there or does our collective expectation open a door through which the paranormal can manifest like like we're the gatekeepers or we're, we're the door guards and if enough people believe in something you get that sort of energetic tipping point that allows that that veil to be broken through or i don't know there's so many different things that it brings up it's really so weird that I remember years ago I felt like kind of an outcast because I first started writing about this stuff. Everybody everybody not everybody but most of the people that I talked to believed in this sort of nuts and bolts a very narrow minded tunnel vision explanation for the ghost for cryptids for UFOs and a ghost is the essence or spirit of a dead person. That's it. Right. That's it, you know? And I love how it's kind of evolved to so many other possibilities, even though it's really frustrating and confusing because now it's like, ah, oh, now we've got to research that, you know? Is this going to be a dead end? Or And the truth is, I think that there are sightings that fit each idea or each theory. You know, like we were talking, like you guys are saying, there's the, the, the residual, the imprint. There's ghosts that interact with the observers, with the people observing them. Um, you know, there's ghosts where people say there was sort of a static electricity pop, um, you know, and then it vanished in the same way, or it sort of flickered in and out of view. I mean, what is that all about? And we hear that with a lot of UFO sightings too, which to me kind of sounds a little interdimensional there. Yeah. Um, and back to the cryptids, you know, do you have big sort of physical prehistoric beasts that just happened to get lost out in the woods and kept breeding? Is it an interdimensional entity of some sort? Um, so it's really nice to kind of go beyond the nuts and bolts explanation. I, I, I think that, and I've said this before a lot, that, when you try to put these things in boxes, they try to like jump out at you and yeah. people try to put them back in the box, but sometimes they don't stay. And the fact is, is that we've got these three boxes, right? We've got UFOs, we've got ghosts, we've got Bigfoot. So we've got all that nice, tidy mm. little thing there. And those are in their boxes. They're in their categories. They don't overlap except for when they do. <laughs> all the time <laughs> all the time I was going to say wait a yeah. minute what are you talking about yeah. and, <laughs> and then you have to then you have to have people that are out there to look and say well okay why is this overlapping and there's still the old guard that's kind of out there saying no they don't overlap there's nothing to it you know I had um, I had a guy on the show one time uh, he had a book about uh, a violent haunting encounter that he had and in the middle of the book, he starts talking about how, and I, I interviewed him when I interviewed him later, he starts talking about how he had this like UFO experience. And he was very easily just kind of put like his haunting experience and his UFO experience into two separate categories. And I kind of challenged him a little bit. And I was like, man, I think you're dealing with the same phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially these reoccurring things for people, and yeah, families, and you know things like that with multiple phenomenon. Right, exactly. Oh, I yeah, I mean, not too long ago, it was like you are a ghost person, or you are a UFO person, or you're a cryptid person. But don't you dare try to say you're, you're two or more, you know. And it was like, you know, if you saw a ghost, it couldn't possibly bleed over uh, into anything else. But then we started getting more and more, more, and more reports of like hotspots, UFO hotspots where people were also seeing ghosts and also seeing cryptids. Or ghost hotspots where I know there's a, like, a couple of canyons in Los Angeles um, to the north of me. Turnbull and Topanga Canyon, I think there's one other, 
where people report ghosts, UFO sightings, and weird cryptid-like entities all in the same place. Right. So it's almost like the doors that are allowing one to come through could be allowing all to come through, but maybe not in every location, you know? A, a haunted house may not necessarily have a door to let, you know, other things come through. It's just a haunted house. But, like, places like Skinwalker Ranch and the Bermuda Triangle and the the Devil's Triangle, now the Great Lakes Triangle, and the Bridgewater Triangle, and all these big hot spots. Um, there, Superstition Mountain is another one. There's so much going on that you're thinking, oh, you know, wow, just this big rip open, and it all came pouring through, you know? Yeah, I've talked about this before, too, about just like um, Rendlesham Forest. And that's kind of become like this real mess in ufology lately because of a lot of like conflicting viewpoints. But I do believe that what happened there, there was a real event and there was real, you know, real genuine strange phenomenon that was occurring simply for the fact because other people before and since have said Reynolds Forest is just a damn weird place and they will see ghosts. They'll see cryptids. They'll see UFOs. It's just, you know, it's one of those places on Earth that this stuff congregates along. Isn't that weird? It's like they're a little vortexes. But I, you know, I think that's cool. We actually, so after I wrote the book, imagine my frustration. I went to lunch (laughs) with a paranormal investigator, Sally Richard, too. Um, She writes a lot about the paranormal. She's a wonderful person, and she said, well, I can't believe you haven't been down to, um, oh gosh, I forgot the name of the road. It begins with a P. Anyway, it's down by the border, which is about, for me, a little over an hour away. But it's still, you know, part of San Diego County. San Diego County is huge. Yeah. So there's this road, and apparently I find out, after the book is out, that people see the hitchhike girl, the, white la- the lady in white, cryptids. Uh, This weird Mothman-like Thunderbird flying thing. Um, People have been reported being abducted. They've seen apparitions. All on this one, it's a very rural, uh, kind of almost deserty, nothing area. And it's like, are you kidding me? Why? I'm not sure how long. Why have I not heard? That's, That's my San Diego vortex. I still haven't gotten down there, but... Wow. So again, does every area on on the, in the United States or on Earth? I don't know. There are a lot of these hot spots and vortexes around. But I would be so curious for another book to invite yeah. people in every every of the fifty states to find one in your state, <laughs> if I, not more than one. I'd say we have at least two here in Tennessee that I can think of. And the first that I can Whoa. think of, oh my gosh. the first I could think of is is Adams, Tennessee, where the Bell Witch occurred. There's still weird stuff Ooh. that happens up oh, there. Oh yeah. And if you go there, and I've been to Adams, I've never been to the cave, but if you go to Adams, it's still a very weird, strange feeling up there. And is it all rural? Oh yeah, it's, it yeah, 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 yeah. It's only yeah. it's about like fifty, I think forty miles from here. Yeah, a lot of a lot of cornfields. Yeah. And also, I think oh, this, yeah, I yeah. think the Smokies. There's weird stuff in the Smokies. Very weird stuff, and especially that's where you get all the disappearances. And I mean, that's that that in and of itself is like a strange place. So there's just oh, these cool. weird places on Earth that 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 this phenomenon manifests itself. That's what it almost seems like the the a lot of times these places are the primary thing, and the phenomenon is just kind of secondary. Yeah. Almost like it comes through. I yeah, wonder what could be that's a causing good point, that. Yeah, you know, it's like is there something you know, geophysically, electromagnetically, all these sort of environmental anomalies that are occurring in these places? Um, yeah, well, you know, some of like the the vile vortices or the ley lines and things like that, where certain spots just resonate at a certain frequency, or they. And the veil between realities is a little thinner. Yeah, for whatever reason, some kind of 
re- reasons we don't understand the the physics of yet. But yeah. per- perhaps yeah. ancient yeah, people. There did. Are. And then you, you get know it. Who does? It's usually the Native Americans that said him. Yeah. Get there before us, and it's funny because they usually will always have stories of these places. And so when you start going back and you're doing your research, you realize oh, this stuff is not new. It has been going on for a long time. Well, if you, you know. Look, if you- <laughs> If you look at the Bill Witch case, uh, Troy Taylor um, was the first one that I heard say this, but I mean, he's got pretty imp- impeccable research on it. In the story, what where it starts with the Bell Witch is the fact that the children of John Bell, the son, started digging into an bar- in Indian burial mound. Right, right. And then, boom, it just all takes off from there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what's going on there? A little bit of the going back kind of like to the Tulpa thing and us causing it. I just kind of made this connection as we're talking here. But you do talk about the cursed movie sets and about Amityville, yeah, and Poltergeist, creepy. Rosemary's Baby. Let's talk a little bit about that. Some of the things that have gone on on those like movie sets because, you know, I think people will get to the sets and they're not haunted. But then all of a sudden, like the subject matter and possibly the energy that is being put out by the actors might cause something to happen. Yeah. Well, not only that, but all a lot. I mean, you know, accidents happen. Um, so you have that. You have those things. If there's a death or something, it sort of builds its own little legend. But a lot, a lot of these movie sets are old. And even though they've been reconstructed, some of them have burned down and been rebuilt. You know, if anything, if uh, any of the old legend, Rudy Valentino, you know, the famous actors and actresses of the past that haunt them, they're going to still stick around. Um, but a lot of actual movie movies that are being shot, you know, movie sets are one thing. There's like Paramount Studios and certain sound stages of Warner Brothers that are haunted because think about all the different actors and actresses that worked there and ended up dying and, hey, I want to go back and there's another movie. <laughs> but what's really creepy are the movies, the specific movies that were haunted, like The Crow. We know uh, Brandon Lee died in a very tragic manner while on the movie set. He was struck and killed by an actual real bullet fragment from a prop gun. And I remember this happening, and I, was, I loved Brandon Lee. I was absolutely heartbroken. So um, during the film, the rest of the film, the crowd, there were a lot of people that were injured. There were accidents. The crew, um, a carpenter was injured. His crane drove into power lines. There was a storm that destroyed most of the sets. So it's almost like they're cursed. A lot of the Exorcist type movies, you know, uh, you'll hear. So here's one: Exorcism of Emily Rose. This, the star, Jennifer Carpenter, during the filming, she portrayed Annalise Michelle, who died. It's one of the few people that actually died of a botched exorcism. Lucky her. So while she was filming the movie, her radio would turn on and off. Uh, it would always play the same song, Pearl Jam's Alive. In the lyrics, I'm still alive, repeated over and over again. <laughs> yeah, creepy. <laughs> creepy. Um, the movie Ghost with uh, Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore was shot on the notorious Stage 19 at Paramount Studios. That's probably the most haunted studio in Hollywood. Um, and a lot of people there reported seeing the ghost of Heather O'Rourke, the little girl, the adorable little blonde girl who starred in Poltergeist, the original Poltergeist, who died very tragically. Yeah. So there's a lot of that creepy stuff. You know, sometimes they're not, you know, the ghosts aren't really, they're not harmful. They're not trying to hurt anybody. Um, you know, they're either apparitions or people will experience things like hearing sounds or hearing footsteps or having their TVs and radios go on and off and their hotel rooms or in their green rooms, excuse me, or in their trailers, that kind of stuff. So, but the Exorcist, 
had a lot of deaths associated with it. Um, several actors died during the filming. There were nine actual deaths associated. The two stars, Ellen Burst and Linda Blair, were injured on the set. Um, a lot of creepy stuff. So, is it is it the mood and the atmosphere <laughs> that's creating people to feel this way? Because, you know, you're filming a horror movie. Um, or is it just negative energy is attracted to negative energy? Yeah. Poltergeist was another one that had a lot of actors' deaths, deaths too. Oh, you my You, gosh, mentioned, you yeah. mentioned Heather O'Rourke, but um, Dominic Dunn. You know, That's she, right, the yeah. teenage girl. Yeah. yeah, her boyfriend stabbed her, killed her. Yep. Um, Three, yeah, she was. Yeah. And then the the yeah. guy that's Ooh. the Indian guy who was also in he was in Poltergeist two, and uh, he was also in uh, One Flew with the Cuckoo's Nest. He died not too long after. Now uh, Julian Beck, who played the the old. Uh, creepy right, priest yeah. in the in the poltergeist too he died but he was already yeah. dying of cancer yeah. at the time so i don't yeah, really i don't really cancer, count that one but, yeah <laughs> yeah true so we have will sampson he's the one the indian the shaman right died of a kidney transplant a year after yeah he attempted to rid the set of the curse but oh that you know it's funny because he did perform a makeshift exorcism um zelda rubenstein who played the psychic Brian Gibson, who directed one of the sequels. I mean, they died years later, but it just seems like... Yeah, yeah I mean, that's another thing. I mean, everybody who dies, you're going to say, oh my gosh, it's part of the curse. Um, but Heather O'Rourke, Chris was really tragic, and there are so many people that have claimed to see her, her ghost on stage 19. I mean, but how, how more ritualistic I, can you be than, you know, actually acting and we know you know acting and the origins of the theater really a lot of that comes from ancient times comes from ritual yep and there's theater yeah, ghosts exactly. all over the place yeah yeah i mean there's still you know universal studios has stage 28 um culver studios had their own sound stage that was charlie chaplin studios there's because they were all so old you know, paramount to this day. They have a couple of stages that are haunted. One of them is really close to a cemetery where a lot of celebrities are buried, and there's actually apparitions of, of people that are buried at the cemetery that are seen kind of coming and going into the Hart Building or uh, Stage 30, 31, on, which are near the... I forgot the name. Oh, it's Hollywood Memorial Park. That's the name of the cemetery. So there have been, there've been people that have reported seeing ghosts like of Rudy Valentino or Douglas Fairbanks yeah. at the cemetery and walking toward the, the studio, you know, the nearest studio door to the cemetery as if they're going to work. So that's, you know, that's one of those, I mean, are they seeing a sort of residual loop or are the ghosts just saying, hey, you know, I'm going to work. In another universe. <laughs> I was I was there in Hollywood uh, last year. Same trip I was telling you about. I went to San Diego on, and uh, there's a darkness about that place. Oh yeah. About which one? Which one? Hollywood. Oh, San Diego is yeah, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? We have the Wiley House, and we have Hotel Del Coronado. Uh, which those are two really, really famous. Yeah, I went to the Whaley House. Haunted locations that I have been to several times. I've uh, never had anything happen at the Whaley House. At uh, the Hotel Dell, I had one experience when I was really little. We used to come out. I used to live in New York. We used to fly out or take the train out to California to see our relatives here. And actually, I think it was the year that we moved out here permanently. And we went to the Hotel Dell because, you know, it's a tourist trap. That's what everybody does when you first come here. And there was a part that there that was under construction. We were taking the tour, and we were by the gift shop, and I was sort of over by the police tape, the caution tape that bordered the area that was under construction. And I got, like, really dizzy, and I felt really repulsed, like, really sick, really dizzy, like, don't go, a, a sense of foreboding. Mm -hmm. 
And it was a little bit later that the woman said, you know, that areas under construction. Oh, and by the way, you know, there was a murder there. And many people have reported seeing the ghosts. And it's like, oh, <laughs> okay. I mean, I have no idea if that's what I was sensing, but it's happened to me a few times. So I might be kind of, I might be more sensitive to the energy. I have never actually seen an apparition or a ghost. Have you guys? I have, but Turfield's. Yeah, he's tired of me telling the story. (laughs) No, you know what? I'd love to hear it because I I write about this stuff. Okay. It's it's a pretty good one. Wait a minute. This this isn't fair, so go ahead. Tell it. (laughs) Okay. Well, um, for for those that are maybe new to Conspiranormal... so when I was when I was a kid, um, I grew up in the same house that my father grew up in when he when he was a kid. So like he rented it from my grandparents, right? Because they moved out, and I saw an old lady standing in the corner of my room, and uh, you know I kind of like passed out, went to sleep had a really weird dream and then seven years later when i was about 14 i was seven when this happened i was in virginia beach with my mom and my aunt and this is my aunt my dad's sister and uh they were talking about the house that we grew up in and she said that when she was a kid she looked over into my father and uncle's room which was later my room 30 years later and she said she saw an old lady in the corner. So it was like a validation. Oh, my God. Yeah. That she had seen it. And when... Okay, did you ever find out who it is? I, you know, really don't know. I mean, I think what uh, my grandparents bought the house back in the... It's gone now. There's no, there's no house there anymore. But they bought the house in the early 50s, probably. And yeah. I think they bought it from an older couple. So I think there's some assumption that there could have been... It could have been one of them, or it could have been somebody that lived in it previously. I think the house had been built in either the 19-teens or the 20s, so it was an old house. Oh, yeah. And it was like the first house on that road, um, which was East Brandon Road in Chattanooga. So, Do you remember what she looked like? I mean, did you you see like a face? I just remember just seeing like, I thought it was like my step-grandmother, was because it looked like her. That's what I remember. I so it's like so gray hair. Somebody showed a picture of her. This lady died in this house in 1932, and you were like, "Oh my God, that's right. no, <laughs> nothing like that ever happened." No, but my mom did have an experience too, where she saw a little boy uh, that she thought was me oh, at first. That's creepy. But she, when she reached out to touch the boy because she thought it was me, it was going to get me back in bed. That it disappeared right in front of her. <gasps> Oh, now see, I would want to yeah. know who is that. I'd be like, yeah, know. you know, well, the, you know, in the movies, how they used to go to the little libraries before mm-hmm. the internet. I would be like, oh my god, who lived here? <laughs> that creeps me out more than anything. Actually, is kids ghosts because it's just yeah, it's yeah, just absolutely. it's just creepy that you know like. You, and you don't know if it's like an actual person or it's like a demon or something pretending to be a ghost. Pretending to be a kid. Oh, like a and kid, yeah. Then also, <laughs> it's just pretty tragic that the child would be stuck forever somewhere, dead. That's awful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's bad. You know what's weird? I mean, you got me thinking too, because like I'm thinking the only places that I really uh, that there were a lot of children ghosts were um, haunted elementary schools, and there's quite a few. Yeah, plane crashes. And, um, uh, oh God, what was the other one? Some of the, like the, the sanatoriums and places where they would put tuberculosis patients and, um, and also orphanages, things like that. But it's weird because you don't normally hear a lot of child ghost stories unless they're specifically associated with a place you know, where children were kept or, or whatever. But, yeah, see, that's weird. Yeah, that's, with, it's that's, that's weird to me with elementary schools, though, because, like, did a bunch of kids die at an elementary school? Like, I would hope not. No, just, sure. let me, that's let me a tell weird you. thing. I know, it is kind of crazy. <laughs> 
So they're older, like one uh, Matthew Whaley Elementary School in Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, founded in 1699. I mean, that's old. Yeah. But there was um, a little boy who the school was named after who actually died in 1698. And, uh, or no, I'm sorry, he died eight years later. So this school, they claim to see his ghost. It frequents the bathrooms and the playgrounds in addition to the spirits of two other boys who were said to be the victims of lynchings who wander about the school. Okay, so another one, Mariposa Elementary School here in California, the city of Redlands. There was the story of a boy named Billy who was hit by a school bus riding his bike near the school. This one's a little sketchy because we don't quite know the right year, but people say that they see his ghost walking around swinging on the playground swings. He knocks on the attendant's office door. (laughs) His ghost, that's really creepy. His ghost has been seen by a number of students on campus. There's one in Amarillo, Texas, Alton, Illinois, Forest Hills, California. I mean, there's not a lot of them, but Post Town Elementary School, that was a big deal. I remember several years ago, Cincinnati, Ohio, a lot of ghost hunting groups were trying to go out there because it has such a history. And I remember the school, I think, tried to stop them from coming and investigating. There was some big brouhaha because people were damaging the property and making a mess. Uh, but that's another, that's a really big haunted elementary school. It's closed now. Lots of ghosts seen there from different train accidents that were nearby at the time. Um, so you're seeing the ghosts of the people that died in the train accident. You're seeing the ghosts of the children that died at the school. So, yeah, there's a few. There's high schools. There's lots of colleges, dormitories. Honestly, it's just mind-blowing. It's like you could you could throw a dart at a map, and there's going to be a, a few hundred haunted stories just in that location. And again, it's places where people congregate a lot. Yeah, yeah. Lots of time, yeah. And it's not always like that location, but like, you know, with Post Town, there were there was a train uh, track right there that there would be train accidents, so you'd get a lot of ghosts from that, too. Double whammy. But yeah, I think places that a lot of people congregate, there's people that die accidentally, people that are murdered, they commit suicide, they fall off a balcony or something. So you're bound to have a lot more of that. We've got one of those train accident sites here in Nashville. There's there was a big train accident like 1918, right? Yeah. Yeah. That happened and that's D- supposedly that Dutchman's Curve. Yeah. We've actually got a line on a possible uh a person who's had a experience with a some kind of ghost they think might be the actual uh what what is that the i guess some kind of operator of the conductor tracks. well not a conductor he's like he was the one who's supposed to switch the tracks oh, oh like the engineer guy the yeah. track engineer yeah the guy that yeah, caused the accident the guy that there. caused the actual accident where, where it was oh, the biggest train wreck in history to that time yeah Let's let's That's talk about creepy. Marie in the time that we got left. I want to, I want to hit this before we let you go. Um, the eleven eleven, the time prompt phenomenon. What that uh, is? Yes. Wasn't it eleven eleven a couple of days ago or yesterday? Yeah, or yesterday. we're recording this on the twelfth, <laughs> so this won't be posted for another couple of weeks <laughs> after. But uh, yeah, eleven eleven was yesterday. So this is yeah, this is uh, was kind of interesting. This is one of the several books where. I knew nothing about the subject matter, and a lot of times the publishers that I work with will approach me, in this case, um, me and Larry Flaxman, and say, hey, you know, would you guys be willing to look into this and write about this 11-11 time park phenomenon? And, you know, I remember Larry and I talking to each other like, huh, what? (laughs) Uh, We had no idea what it was. And so, you know, once we started looking into it, we realized, oh, wow, there's this huge global phenomenon of people seeing various time prompts or number sequences. They don't always have to be on a clock. 
that they ascribe meaning to, usually some kind of spiritual meaning to it. And what was interesting when we first read 11.11, this was before December 21st, 2012, and the whole end of the Mayan calendar, oh my God, is the world going to end thing. We actually found a connection with that in that the time of the winter solstice on December 21st, 2012, was 11.11 Greenwich Mean Time. So a lot of people had ascribed this meaning to, this is before 2012, that, oh my gosh, everybody is seeing 11.11, it's a wake-up call, we got to get our you-know-what together because we're going to be ascending to the fifth dimension and have this big spiritual transformation. Well, 2012 came and went, we're all still alive, most of us. And I don't know that we all ascended. I don't know what it would feel like, but I don't feel like I have. I'm still the same person. But, you know, that was one of the myths. However, the phenomenon has persisted. And there's two reasons. So first of all, we have millions of people seeing number sequences. Mine is 333. I wake up at 333 every night, and I have for years, even before I wrote this book. And I just thought it was crazy. Um, somebody else might be 12, 12, or 4, 4, 4, whatever. Whatever your time thing is that you see. So a lot of people say that what it is, is that it has some kind of numeral, numerological meaning. Um, you know, you can add up the numbers, and then you have the master number, and you can go to your numerologist and find out what that means. Some people say that they're little wake-up calls from the universe to pull you back into the present moment, which I, which actually is what happens when you see it. You know, you're suddenly very present. Your brain is very much aware. Oh, check it out, love it, love it. The other side of the story is really more mundane, and it is that our brains seek out patterns. They love patterns. They like to make patterns out of chaos. The numbers are very chaotic to us unless they are put in some kind of order. So let's say you see 11, 11 on the clock once. Ah, eh, big deal. You see it twice in the same day, you know, morning and evening. It's, oh, wow, check it out. What a coincidence. Well, let's say you see it a third time. You know, driving around, you see it on a billboard or a park bench sign or bus bench or whatever. Now, it's more than just a little coincidence. Your brain is like, whoa, why do I keep seeing this? Now, all of a sudden, your brain is going to start seeking it out. It's, well, those numbers have always been all around us, but you never really had reason to notice until it became important to you. And now you're going to see it everywhere. And that's just part of the brain called the reticular activating system. It's at the base of the primal brain, the brain stem, and it literally filters tons of information that's coming at the brain that is not important to our day-to-day -day survival out, and it filters in or allows in the information that we need to survive. But the RAS also, once it sees a pattern, will allow that to skip through the filters and, you know, become perceived by the brain. This could explain paranormal phenomena, too, if you think about it. So the book starts exploring that phenomenon, but then it really gets into the whole mysterious and, and actually paranormal nature of numbers and mathematics, mathematical ratios, you know, the, the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio. And it gets into numerology, it gets into sacred geometry, and gematria, Kabbalah. And then it gets into the science of the fact that our entire universe may actually be constructed around six mathematical ratios. So it covers the gamut of everything involving numbers that you could think of. Um, but mainly these weird time prompts that people see. So you guys must have one. Uh, I don't, I don't necessarily have one, but, um, I have been really attuned to the clock in different like jobs and things like that. And, uh, waking up before alarms, waking up at exact hours. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I always thought that was fascinating. Just how like somehow I'm 
you know, attuned to this mathematical thing. I'm not even looking at, I'm asleep or I'm, I'm having some kind of precognition of the alarm, you know, waking up right before the alarm goes off and experiences like that, which is really weird. I don't know how that, how that works. Like you look at your phone in a dream and it's the same, it's the same time as when you actually look at your phone when you woke up. Have you had that happen? No. That's happened to me. <laughs> oh, uh, I've not, I, I haven't had that, but yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. I thought cell phones but didn't yeah, show up I in mean, dreams. You know, I, yeah, I don't line. use an alarm clock. <laughs> well, you know, mathematics is the language of the universe, according to scientists and physicists, and everything can really be whittled down to a specific mathematical formulation or ratio. So numbers are way more important than just balancing our checkbooks or, you know, telling time or whatever. And it was actually my dad who was, my dad was always prompting me to write a book about numbers. My dad was a geophysicist and an, and he had a background in astrophysics and uh, uh, geology and he wow. loved numbers. And, and uh he wanted me to write, and I said, Dad, I hate math. I hate it. I hated it in school. I, you know, I, I don't get numbers. I can't balance my checkbook. I just sort of wing it and pray. Um, I don't like, like, I don't have, I have the right brain, the creative brain. And he said, no, 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 you know, you're into the paranormal. You have got to look into to numbers and mathematical ratios. And it really is spooky how complex an intricate the universe that we live in is to the point that again it you know if anything were tweaked ever so slightly in a negative or positive we would not exist the universe would not exist galaxies the chemicals that make up life the you know biological stuff of life would not exist so that kind of got me really into writing it and it's numbers are archetypal. They really are. They're symbolic. They each number means something. Um, my favorite number is three. It's the number of perfection. Pythagoras, you know, a lot of these uh, old philosophers, they loved certain numbers because of what they symbolically represented. So it's a really interesting book. It's not just about the 1111 phenomenon, which is still huge to this day. 33 for me is a number that came up a lot for a little while when I came became really like into the stuff about the 33rd degree parallel. Right. I'd have it's weird, weird stuff like right. that. And all of a sudden I just kept seeing 33 everywhere. People saying 33. There was at one point that I was getting really into like all that, all that stuff. And, uh, well, the free that material. Is, yeah, that's a huge number. Right. Free right. Yeah. And uh I'm I'm pulling out of pulling out of work with my friend going to lunch and I look over and there's a fire engine and it says thirty three on it and I'm like, Come on, man. Uh, like, what, what in the world? <laughs> but for me, uh for me people's names has much more of a resonance, I think, than numbers. Because That's all of a sudden very like similar phenomenon, yeah. Yeah. Like all of a sudden I will you know, if if somebody like, you know, comes in my life, all of a sudden I'll see that name everywhere. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's it's now that you're you now you're more, but I think some of that is like you're more attuned to it because now you're exactly. much more aware of it. Yeah, because somebody pointed it out to you. It's like you know, yeah. I always use the analogy of like if you're buying a car, <clears throat> and you decide you want to buy a purple Corvette, because Lord knows nobody has a purple Corvette. You want to be the most unique person on the highway. You go buy one. You driving it, drive it out of the lot. And you see three more go by. <laughs> It's like, are they just, you know, they were always there. But until or is everybody a having a midlife crisis it, at the same time? Yeah, I mean, until it became important to you, your RAS yeah. filtered it out. You didn't need to get it. You to know how many purple Corvettes were out on the road. But when you decided to buy one, it became important enough for you to take that information in. And now, boom, you're seeing it everywhere. Right. So that's what yeah. it could be, which is very mundane and boring. A lot of people that see their number prompts, they feel like it means something. They feel like they experience more synchronicities when it happens, which to me just means they're they're in the present. Because if you're living in the past or stressed out about the future, you 
are not in a position to experience the synchronicity. So there's a lot of different explanations to what it could be. I think synchronicities are very profound, and I think that they serve as a way to kind of point you in the right direction. Yeah, but how often do people notice them now because we're so distracted by right. stuff, you know? I mean, we got yeah. so many things pulling at our attention that, you know, just noticing those kinds of things could be why these time clubs happen. You know, it's like your brain's way of saying, hey, pay attention. This is important. You're going to miss this. Well, um, Marie, thank you so much. This has been an awesome discussion. Um, I know that you're, you, know, you well, thank I you. thank you for coming you on for and absolutely. absolutely. Um, tell people where they can find the book and, uh, on celebrity ghosts and then also the, all your other books as well. Well, they should be anywhere books are sold. Barnes and Noble, Amazon, books a million online, awesome Excuse me, they're also an all in audio book. I know a lot of people like audio books. And they're also in libraries. So visit your local library. Cool. Nice. No better place. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and people can find also uh, you at like mariedjones.com? That's my website, yeah, mariedjones.com. Always up right. to something. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Marie. Stay on the line for us. Uh, we're going to close this section out. And as always, we'll be back to close out the show on Conspiracy Normal. Ghosts. Celebrity gro- ghosts. Celebrity ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> you uh you kinda quiet on that one. Yeah, a little yeah. Bit. I was just I was just listening, you know. Yeah. And so I know that's not your usual wheelhouse, it's kind of the more uh I guess popular supernatural kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I eat it up. So Yeah, um I thought it was the celebrity component is interesting. Um I wanted to kind of touch on some things that we didn't get to as far as um, really kind of this, uh, the the Kenneth Anger ideas of Hollywood being this big uh, mystical magic factory and the stars being these mythological characters for us and the role of tragedy in all these stars' lives, which is, has this mythological component to it. And... Uh, you know, the, the tragedies causing these hauntings. So that's real interesting. And I know like she's talked a lot about houses too, celebrities, haunted houses who they buy from other celebrities and kind yeah. of pass down. And, right. And what, you know, what is Hollywood really? You know, we touched on some of the stuff with Jay Dyer and stuff too. So, yeah, I was trying to kind of steer it towards that when I talk about how, like how dark Hollywood seemed to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I was kind of thinking about the Kenneth Anger stuff too, the Hollywood Babylon yeah. and all that. And we have something on a, a, a smaller level here, but similar with Nashville. You yeah. Know, it's the same kind of thing, the same kind of boulevard of broken dreams, you know, we well, see, we were down there not that long ago. Yeah. And it's the, the same way. It's the and, same kind of energy as Hollywood Boulevard. I don't feel it is that it's as dark though as, as Hollywood Boulevard. There was a darkness there, definitely. Yeah, that, yeah. It's that more Nashville doesn't really have. It's more because it's more revelrous, you know. Yeah, yeah. But there was definitely uh, there was definitely a darkness there in in Hollywood that I that I picked up on. Maybe it's just because I was so I'm so engrossed in the stories and I know so much about it, the film industry and all that. Well stuff. I've heard like Genesis uh Piorge say it's it's uh that LA itself is just such an amplifier. Yeah. That either, you know, if you're on a good or bad path, like it's going to, you know, just amplify that. So if, you know, you're really positive, able to use it to your advantage, it's gonna just go up. But if it's going down, it's gonna go way down. So is Kenneth Anger, is he saying that um, 
partaking in the ritual. I don't I don't is, think he's gone into that as much. He's just really like I'm sure he probably has somewhere, but I'm not I'm not really familiar, but he really talks about just the the role that these stars occupy as the mythology as the heroes of our times. Okay. Okay. Kind of like the god and goddess. But I think he does talk about, you know, when you're embodying characters and so I guess, yeah, yeah, he does. Right. 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 I I know that there's some occultic things about acting and about embodying and taking on a role or taking on a persona. I know that there's some ideas that are in that, that are there. Absolutely. So, and just the, the, uh, the desire for transcendence, for becoming something else, for becoming a star, you know, for yeah, that yeah. De- that desperation, you know, that to be more something more, you know, it's almost a kind of alchemical, transformative type of thing, you know, that you see in like good point. That basically, every Disney movie is about, if you think about it. Yeah, good point. Good point. Very good point. Uh, was there anything else that you th- were thinking about you? We didn't get to cover. Um, I wanted to get into the bridges and tunnels. Bridges and tunnels. She talks a lot about bridges and tunnels as haunted places and urban legends surrounding bridges and tunnels and different cities and places. So are we going with the fact that the possibility of like liminality? Yeah, I was thinking about just those kind of similar themes we're always talking about. Okay. Yeah. One of the things about this interview um, with Marie was like, you know, we we talked a little bit more than we do in normal interviews because she's just had some problems with her voice. Oh. So I just wanted to keep her kind of, you know, not not exhausted yeah, yeah. <laughs> very much. So that's why there was probably a little bit more of a conversational style on this interview, just in case of any, anybody's wondering. Um, so is there anything else that we wanted to add before we close out? Um, I did not get to Urban Legends. Uh, kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that, especially like the Walking Sam stuff in, um, I think that's the Sioux Indian Reservation, and uh, the Cropsey stuff in Staten Island. I think is pretty interesting, but uh, we could talk about what that with her later. Or we can also uh, can talk about the Cropsey stuff actually with uh, Tom and Jenny from Thirteen O'clock. They did a little uh, segment about that. But you have an a, an album here. Yes. That you got for... Just got today. Yeah, explain what this is. From uh, someone I know in Nashville named Jay Millar, who uh, co-owns a record label called Modern Harmonic, which is really awesome. They're doing really great reissues. Uh, one of the probably coolest uh, reissue record labels in the world. And uh, they he when I first met him, he uh, told me about this classic ufo interview record that they were going to re-release called file 733 ufo further investigation and uh it was made by this guy jack jenkins it's a series of interviews uh with contactees and uh ufo witnesses and uh, he tries to get all the scientists and stuff so this is kind of similar to the long john nibble uh interview record i got yeah uh, but then this was also uh, done, it's like a double record that he also did in partnership with a guy on a guy, Mike Mannix, uh, the host of a show called Psych Out on a lo- the local WXNA station here. So the other record is all this uh, psychedelic and I guess real droney tripped out stuff that you, you play along with the uh along with the ufo interviews so it's pretty cool pretty cool project yeah and, we were we were listening to some of this right before we started the show and uh there was one uh, there was one of the guys that he's that he spoke to kept referring to the lead alien that he encounters as the gentleman, the gentleman. i talked to the gentleman which i thought was interesting and then he also talks to wayne aho which we talked about him with uh way back at the beginning of the year major a-hole yeah major aho yeah with uh adam go rightly and greg bishop so this is some some interesting stuff so this is called file 733 file number 733 ufo further investigation yeah by modern harmonic yeah and it's out now on vinyl and cd i believe on 
Modern Harmonic Records, and thanks a lot, Jay, for the copy. Yeah. There's your plug, and uh, I would definitely tell anyone to go check it out. It's uh, pretty cool. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so that's it, guys. Thanks, thank you so much for for listening to this episode of Conspira Normal. Um, incidentally, about uh, contactees that uh, Serfiel mentioned when he's talking about this album, uh, we're going to be talking to someone next week about the secret cipher of the UFO knots, and I'm really excited about this one. So, if you know anything about it, you know who we're talking about. But Patreon. So if you'll tell everybody where they can find us on Patreon. You can Patreon. find us on patreon.com slash conspiranormal or make a one-time donation on conspiranormal.com. Got lots of great bonus content on the Patreon. That's right. Give us lots of money. And also, you can leave a good review on iTunes. That really helps us out. And... Also, go to YouTube, Conspiracy Normal Podcast. You can find us there. Please give us a, please subscribe, give us a like button on there. So, that's it, guys. We'll be back next week talking about some, doing some ciphering on Conspiracy Normal. If you would like to help the show, please consider becoming a Patreon at www.patreon.com slash conspiranormal or leave a one-time donation at conspiranormal.com and please check out our YouTube channel, Conspiranormal Podcast. <laughs>